Hello and welcome to Down the Scoop. Today we'll be covering the histology of hair follicles and how to identify hair follicles in each of the phases of the hair cycle. If you think of any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Hair follicles are invaginations of the epidermis into the dermis and are composed of the follicular epidermis, the hair shaft, sebaceous glands, and sometimes a bit of smooth muscle that controls the hair's position. There are three anatomic areas of the hair follicle. The infundibulum is defined as the portion from the epidermal surface to the sebaceous duct. The isthmus continues from the sebaceous duct to the junction of the cornified and non-cornified inner root sheath. Here's an image of the junction, also known as Adamson's fringe for reference. If you don't understand the term cornified, you can check out the first video on the epidermis, which has a more detailed explanation. The inferior portion then extends from this junction to the hair bulb right at the bottom of the hair follicle. The appearance of the hair follicle changes depending on whether the hair is actively growing or not. Let's start out with the appearance of a hair follicle in anagen phase. This is the active growth phase of the hair so most of the features of the hair follicle are visible. Most of the images I'll show you are transverse sections through a hair follicle, so just bear that in mind while we look at them. During anagen, the hair follicle extends into the deep dermis and sometimes into the subcutis. Right at the base of the follicle, there is the hair bulb. The hair bulb is made up of an epidermal component wrapped around some mesenchymal cells. You can see the mesenchymal cells in the center here. This is the dermal papilla. The cells here play an important role in regulating hair growth. Traditionally, the vascular connective tissue supplies nutrients and oxygen to the dividing epidermal cells. The basophilic epidermal cells surrounding the dermal papilla are matrix cells. These are germ cells that will produce both the follicular epidermis and the hair shaft so it's common to see mitotic figures in this population. You might also see melanocytes in and around the hair bulb, producing pigments that will colour the hair shaft. Moving up the hair follicle, the dermal papilla disappears and the matrix cells begin to differentiate into cell lines that will form the hair shaft and those that will form the follicular epidermis. In this image, you can start to see differentiated cells forming discrete layers. The hair shaft is formed of three layers, the medulla in the centre, the cortex in the middle, and the cuticle around the outside. The next two layers will form the follicular epidermis. The inner root sheath is distinguished by cells that contain bright eosinophilic cytoplasmic granules. These are trichohyalin granules. The outer root sheath is the layer of cells that contacts the adjacent dermis. Just like for the epidermis and the basal cells that contact the dermis, there is a basement membrane between the outer root sheath and the dermis. You might have trouble distinguishing the layers at this level, but moving a little further up, you'll be more convinced. There is no separation yet between the inner root sheath and the hair shaft. As we move further up the hair follicle, the cells are differentiating even more. The medulla of the hair shaft is now a tiny portion with the cortex forming the bulk. The cells of the cortex are producing keratins, turning their cytoplasm more eosinophilic. The cells of the cuticle have flattened and are forming a more convincing barrier. Meanwhile, the inner root sheath looks quite similar, but you'll notice the development of a hyaline eosinophilic layer at the margin between the inner and the outer root sheath. The inner root sheath is actually formed of two cell layers. Henley's layer and Huxley's layer. These can be difficult to identify, but here you can do so with some certainty. Henley's layer is the first layer to cornify, in other words, lose the nucleus and much of the cytoplasm of the cells. This eosinophilic layer that's appeared is formed of cornifying cells. You can sometimes make out faint nuclei, so this must be Henley's layer. The other cells containing trichohyaline granules are Huxley's layer. The outer root sheath is beginning to thicken as well. Again, moving up the hair shaft and cornification is well underway in both layers of the inner root sheath and the hair shaft. Notice how the cells of the hair shaft cortex 
are beginning to lose their nuclei, while those of the cuticle are fully cornified. Finally, once cornification is completed, the layers of the hair shaft are no longer visible. The inner root sheath is fully cornified. The outer root sheath persists and is now fully developed and much thicker than it was to start with. Let's have a little look at that in longitudinal section. In this image, you can see each of the layers beginning to cornify. You can even spot the point where the inner root sheath cornifies and separates from the hair shaft. This is Adamson's fringe that we discussed earlier and demarcates the border between the isthmus and the inferior portions of the hair follicle. So that's how a hair shaft grows and develops within the hair follicle. As we mentioned before, hair follicles undergo a cycle of hair growth and loss. The stage at which the hair shaft grows and develops is called anagen. You can identify anagen follicles because they'll have all of the features we just discussed, from the dermal papilla to cornification of the various layers of the hair shaft and follicular epidermis. Once hair growth is finished, the matrix cells of the bulb undergo apoptosis and the hair follicle loses contact with the dermal papilla. This is the catagen phase, which is characterized by regression of the hair bulb. Once regression is complete, the hair follicle enters the telogen phase, which is quiescent. The hair shaft is still present, but the hair bulb is smaller and more inactive. Telogen follicles eventually lose their hair. The loss of the hair shaft should stimulate the hair bulb to begin replicating and contacting the dermal papilla to begin the antigen phase again. In terms of histology, you can identify hair follicles in catagen and telogen phase because the hair shaft is held in place by keratin produced by the inner root sheath. Since the hair is no longer anchored by the hair bulb, this keratin will maintain the hair within the follicle. It blurs the distinction between the shaft and follicular epithelium, giving it a wrinkled appearance. We're nearly there. Just a few other important parts of the hair follicle histology to tie up. Hair follicles also have some additional structures associated with them in the dermis. Most follicles will have a sebaceous gland. These are formed of large foamy cells that produce sebum, which has important roles in skin barrier maintenance and hair lubrication. The gland is surrounded by a layer of basal cells which undergo mitosis. The resulting sebocytes will begin producing sebum, which expands the cytoplasm until the mature cell undergoes apoptosis, releasing its secretions into a duct that leads to the hair follicle. This is an example of holocrine secretion. Hair follicles can also have smooth muscle associated with them, which can alter the position of the hair. This is the erector pili muscle. Contraction will raise the hair and is not under conscious control. Mainly this is part of thermoregulation, with hairs trapping a layer of air close to the skin. However, some species, such as dogs, will raise the thicker guard hairs on their backs and necks as a response to adrenaline. This might be to communicate fear and anxiety, or be a response to excitement or curiosity. Another species difference is the number of hair follicles per infundibulum. Herbivores and omnivores tend to have simple hair follicles, where one hair shaft exits one infundibulum. However, carnivores and rabbits have compound hair follicles, where many hair shafts exit from a single infundibulum. Finally, animals have special sensory hair follicles called vibrissi or whiskers. These are large hairs that are surrounded by a blood sinus. Movement of the hair distorts the blood sinus, which initiates an action potential in sensory nerves. They're extremely sensitive and often have quite a large nerve associated with them. So that's everything I can think of to say about hair follicle histology. Thanks for making it to the end. If you have any suggestions for future topics, you can leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.